welcome to another episode of Recipe to Success. Today, to everyone who's asked for female guests, I mean, this one's going to be special. Before we get into the video, be sure to subscribe, like, comment, all of that good stuff. Let's go straight into it. Dr. Jabal, how are you? Hi, Hamza. I'm very well. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. As you know, uh, we've been speaking off camera. I've had comments, DMs. Why don't you get females on? Why yes. don't you get females on? Um, and I think for me, it's important to have the female perspective. And you're someone that... You know, I've I've looked at, I've seen. Wow, like she's got some amazing stuff going on. So, for anyone that has never seen you before, uh, knows nothing about your business, give us a little introduction. Thank you. So, my name is Dr. Jabba. I am a cosmetic dentist based in London, and I have my own practice where um, where we practice cosmetic and general dentistry. That's me in a nutshell. <laughs> okay. So, how did you get into it? I mean, let's go straight into the story. Yeah. Where did the dental practice, the aesthetic clinic, come from? So, it was one of those, um, it was never actually on my radar. So, when I qualified from dental school, I was dead set on like staying in hospital and kind of going up the hospital ranks and becoming a consultant. And for me, that was like the definition of success. So I was really dead set on it. And I, I spent two years in hospital and I had great feedback from the consultants. You know, you have a lot of potential and things like that. Um, I wanted to supplement my hospital work with some work in general practice because hospital work is a lot slower. And sometimes you can de-skill in certain areas, but in general practice, you know, you're busy, patients in and out, lots of treatments. And I phoned up a family friend who was the previous owner of where we are now. Okay to say hi uncle <laughs> um are you looking to hire an associate and he said you know what i actually am but i'm also looking to sell and i was like okay well i'm not really interested but if you're looking for an associate um my husband heard that conversation and he was like we are interested and i was like what um so i really had to kind of i'm one of those people that really believes in fate and there are times you know hamza where we have like dead set plans for ourselves but then something happens something comes in and you're like opportunities like that don't just come right so when they come you have to take a step back and you have to kind of believe in that journey and reflect and i thought you know what let's take this opportunity and see where we go with it so how how long ago was this this was eight years ago i was wow. 26 so i was very young i had no clue when it came to running a business i'm a clinician at heart that's what i trained to do and so it was a very steep learning curve. So I'm guessing the past year has probably been your hardest year in business? Yeah, um, yes and no. I think it's been a really insightful year. Um, initially, I think the first lockdown was the toughest, only because there was just so much uncertainty. And in, in dentistry, there was information wasn't trickling down from top bottom. There was just a lot of talk down here. And it was actually quite stressful trying to figure out, you know, when are we opening? What are the new rules like? I was doing a lot of research, looking at how other countries who had kind of the COVID pandemic and they were ahead of us, how did they implement returning back to work? Mm -hmm. um, so it was a very strange time. Um, but I think, you know, I think it's, it's because we were all in the same boat every business was hit right i think that made it feel a little bit better in that okay we can cope we can get through this and it's just a pause in what is going to be inshallah you know huge road to success but it's just a pause let's embrace it and let's try and see how we can come back with a with a bank you know mm -hmm. come back bigger and better amazing so you mentioned eight years ago you decided to buy this place um, where we are now and it didn't look like this by the way <laughs> <laughs> you changed it all. yeah 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 but my question is obviously you've you decided to take that leap and you got involved but how did you know what you were doing because you literally had no business experience where did it yeah. all come from so there's a lot of learning on the job a lot of late nights here um, initially I was doing everything I was doing the dentistry of course I had um, an associate to help I was doing the practice management I was doing like the hours the rotors the team was a lot smaller back then so we were we're now a team of 10 we were only a team of three so it was a lot kind of easier to manage and then slowly slowly we grew but I think it was 2014 so two years in I realized that actually one of the things you learn in business is that you can't be everywhere in your business, right? 
you have to recognize where are your biggest assets you know and as as a business my biggest asset is treating patients that's what i'm trained to do so why don't i hire a practice manager yeah um and again it took i had to convince my husband that this was the right move to do um and he he agreed of course and it was the best thing that we ever did because now somebody was in charge somebody skilled in that field and i just had to liaise and coordinate and obviously oversee as as the as the principal or the business owner you always have to oversee every avenue of your business you can't turn a blind eye to it but it's really important to get the right people for the right job and you also to focus on your main assets um and so that's and she's she's with us till till today now so that was kind of a really big turning point for me in the business did you ever have like fears of control because i know it, from my journey I, when i first started i was really scared to bring on staff because i was like well i don't know if they're going to be able to do it as good as me or i don't know if they're going to make mistakes and these little yeah. things so was that a problem for you yeah i mean i am a bit of a perfectionist um in life generally i like to always do things myself because i think i trust myself but uh, you slowly learn as you as you grow in your business as your time becomes more scarce that you have to start to let let go of these things um and the biggest point for me learning to let go is actually when i became a mum and i realized that i'm not allowing my husband the opportunity to bond let him do things wrong but this is his time and it you know different avenues of life teach you to do different things which you then can transfer those skills into your business where you say you know it's okay so so my attitude is let people make mistakes it's fine we all make mistakes and i'm always telling the team guys i don't mind repeating myself 10 times so come forward if you need more training if you need more help but let's all be very open so we try to have a very open culture in the practice there's no blame but we try to all hold our hands up when things could be improved um, and I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you got into business. Prior to that, did you always know this was the field that you were going to go into? Dentistry? No. So um, I'm I'm Iraqi, and um, if you're Iraqi, you only really have three career options, right? Yeah, dentistry, <laughs> doctor, or lawyer, right? Um, so I up until the age of sixteen, I was like going to be a doctor. That was what I was dead set on. And it was when I became sixteen. And I started to kind of appreciate what working life of different professions was like. And from that age, I, I knew I always wanted a family. So I thought, hmm, I'm not too keen on these, like being on call 24 hours, like working through the night. So I'll go for dentistry. And I actually faced resistance from my parents, believe it or not. Yeah, for, for months, it was like, how could you, you know, like... As they, in because it was a they saw down? it as a downgrade really yeah so in iraq historically yeah, the top five percent of students would get into medicine automatically and then the second batch would get into dental school and then the third would go into pharmacy so for them i was downgrading and how could i downgrade wow. so it was really interesting because you know other parents would have just been happy right but no since they, they've obviously embraced it and they're infinitely proud of of where I am today so mm -hmm. but how did you deal with that in the moment because I'm guessing it must have been quite difficult I'm really stubborn so um, uh, my parents are refugees so and I'm the eldest so when we first came to this country there was a big change for them big cultural shift and there was a lot of moments where you know it was like head to head no this is okay I can do it and them being unsure so I've kind of had that all my life and when it came to that it was just like no come on guys and I'm very much you know negotiator and I'll always talk and look and present to them these the statistics like actually mom dad dental schools are more inundated with applicants dentistry is harder to get into in this country than medicine so yeah I mean in my nature I, if I want something I will work really hard to get it mm -hmm. so eight years I mean that's quite a long time um, most businesses fail in their first year and you know I, I think it's it's important to understand that you have been running the business but you've also been treating your patients so how do you juggle everything as well as being a mother as well and a wife yeah, and uh, and I just completed my master's, so as a student wow, for five years as well. So um, I think when you're very passionate about something, you will be able to dedicate that time and commitment to it. And I've always been really, really passionate about my career 
and what I do. And I would probably say the first few years I spent very much focusing on myself and the business was a side thing, if that makes sense. I, I always had a vision for the practice and, you know, by the grace of God, we are getting closer and closer to the vision that I've always wanted and it's taken a really long time. But I knew that in order to get to that vision, I myself had to be an amazing clinician because if you want to establish a high-end private practice that is, you know, cosmetic in nature, you have to have the skills to deliver that kind of work. And so I spent the first five years really work, working on my skill set. You know, dentistry is a skill. A lot of people DM me and say, you know, how did you learn? You, you don't come out of dental school being really good at dentistry. Wow. It's just like any other skill, you have to practice. And the more you practice, the better you get. And you have to critique your work. And it's something that you, you might know the theory, but you then have to create the neurons in the brain to tell your hands to deliver in that way, right? Mm. So I probably spent the first five years working on that and then I recognized that I could benefit from a postgraduate qualification to really hone my skill set. Um, and so in 2016, I started my master's whilst also being a trainer. So I was a trainer for undergraduates. So when they came out of university, they were assigned a mentor and I was a mentor for the London Deanery. So I did that and at the same time I was doing, um, I did a PG cert in clinical education. So it's a teaching qualification. Um, it was a lot, it was crazy. <laughs> Everyone said to me, you, you're actually crazy because I had a, a little boy at the time as well. But I remember that year distinctly, there was a lot of late nights, Hamza, you know, it was eight o'clock, put Yusuf to bed and then from about eight to midnight I was studying and working, meeting deadlines, you know, doing all nighters, which is like I'm too old for this. <laughs> and um, it took five years to get that master's done. You know, I had another baby in between. Wow. <laughs> that was easier than getting that qualification. But we I, I submitted the January, the start of this year. Wow. So <laughs> juggling has been, I think, your number one skill, because this is something I'm always fascinated about from the female perspective, because I think females don't really get enough credit in the sense that they have all these pressures whether that is cultural traditional pressures that oh you need to look after the kids or whatever it may be and if you're a career driven woman as well then you have to balance that and a lot of the time you do see females that maybe sacrifice yeah. um the family life for example because they want to follow their career dreams so for anyone that's watching especially the females um who are in that predicament of do I go down the traditional path or do I go down the career path or do I balance the both like yourself what would you advise so if if they're not married yet I would say be really picky with your partner you know a, a big part of where I am today is because I have a husband who's infinitely supportive you know when I said I wanted to do a master he says go for it when I say look I'm you know I'm teaching this weekend so, so I teach now as well okay fine you know you need to work from home on this day yep you know there's never been any resistance and I've spoken about this on on my Instagram posts a few times because I do get asked and I say look you you need to be picky support is one thing verbal support is one thing but it's the physical support it's okay to say yeah I don't mind go and go do it but then if you then when you come back home and it's like oh why is the house messy or why are the kids this then you're not really getting that support from the house so not only do I have the you know, emotional support and the backing, but there's never any mum guilt with it. You mm. know, it's, and I think that's a really big part because mum guilt is real. And to have a partner who can carry his weight and, you know, deliver his part of the parenting journey while supporting me, I think it's really important. So for, for younger girls, I would say, be very clear in, in pursuit in recognizing somebody who's not just going to be a husband but a real partner in the true definition of a word and that means there'll be times when they'll have to make their sacrifices in their careers so um it's a two-way thing of course it's a two-way thing i mean you know on on wednesdays usually my husband works from home because that's the days that i was in clinic so he would you know do his part and again i i don't want to like applaud him as i don't think that it's something that's like wow personally it is though I, think, I mean well in this I think, day and age unfortunately unfortunately but it shouldn't be mm -hmm. that should be the norm but sadly 
the bar is set low for some of our male counterparts when it comes to parenting and their their role as fathers the bar is set low so anytime somebody's like slightly supportive it's like wow he's such a such an amazing husband but you know no one turns around and says like wow she's such an amazing wife and mother look what she's juggling and and women do it all the time you know they juggle a lot so that's the first thing and the other thing is you have to be genuinely passionate because the journey to success is painful right late nights are not easy to do that self-discipline that comes with cancelling on your friends i remember for a year or so i hardly had a social life because i couldn't justify it i was like i'm already spending time away from the family so i can't spend more time away and i need to study and that's that's a difficult thing to do i mean most recently when i had to submit my thesis we were actually in dubai and i spent a lot of time hamza sat in the lobby with my laptop that was painful because the kids are like Where the mom are you not coming no guys i'm really sorry i've I really need to study. I remember one time the the waiter, uh, I was there until maybe uh, like he finished his shift at midnight. I was still there working. And then he started again the next morning and he found me there again. And he said, did you, madam, did you go to sleep? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I did. Don't worry, just a few hours. <laughs> Girls want to leave first. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think you, you've got to find that in you. You've got to really want something because that that passion will get you through the dark the dark difficult moments mm-hmm. when you're by yourself with a cup of coffee or late at night trying to submit or study or whatever a mm-hmm. couple of things i want to touch upon based on what you said yeah first you said um in terms of finding a partner there's certain traits that you have to look out for so what what would you say i mean other than intuition <laughs> are there specific traits that you can identify early on because some of the things you wouldn't really really know unless you get into the situation. It's true, but I think very early on, very early on when there are no kind of emotions, I mean, you know, in our culture, generally things are very platonic at the beginning. They're almost like a business transaction, which actually makes it easier for you to almost negotiate what you want. Be very, very clear at the beginning that your career is super important. And if anything, exaggerate it. The reality is when you become a mother, you will make those sacrifices anyway. You know, most women I know have cut down their working hours. They now work part time because they don't want to be away from their families. Right. Mm -hmm. But exaggerate it to say, you know, I I don't think I ever want to give up my career. Really kind of see the triggers in this person and see whether they are going to be triggered by that or whether they are genuinely going to be supportive. Mm -hmm. But life changes right nothing is set in stone but it's about having somebody with you who is flexible and who's also passionate about what you want to achieve Mm -hmm. and what you want to do also i mean i don't want to mention him too much but he's also in business right so yeah is do you think that is the advantage or because i'm guessing that must be even difficult even more difficult sometimes Uh, i i think that's the advantage is that we are both very ambitious and so there's no one party that's kind of sitting around waiting for the other one to come home or you know we spend most of our evenings each one of us on our laptops just getting on with things and we're both equally passionate and i think that helps maybe if he was in a you know a nine to five he would struggle maybe with me being so occupied and busy and vice versa. So I think we actually really complement each other in that sense and that we're both, you know, it's always what's next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. And um, in regards to the point that you mentioned about um, the the kind of perseverance needed um, when the dark days are there, were there ever moments where you were in doubt that like wow can i actually do this maybe yeah. not necessarily the business per se but the other things that you were juggling with the education side of things or yeah. whatever it was so i i was actually i actually was actually dead set on giving up a few months ago um i spoke to four people one of which was my husband and i said to him look i just i don't think i can do this anymore yeah i was at the last stage of the masters which is submitting the thesis So the first three years were very clinical. They were applicable to my line of work and it was kind of what I wanted out of a master's to improve my clinical skills. The last hurdle, which was the dissertation, was just a written task. It's a very academic task, right? So I just thought, 
this is not going to serve me. You know, I'm going to spend easily 100 hours. I mean, if I spent those hours on my business, my business would flourish. So in my mind, I justified it as that reason, although I'd already paid my fees and everything. And it was three months to the deadline. And for some reason, Hamza, I just never got around to sending that email to my supervisors to say, I'm really sorry, but I, I think I'm going to exit the program. Bear in mind, they'd already asked me to do that twice in, in the course of the program. There were several times they told me, oh, we think you should exit, we don't think you're going to make it. And it was lockdown two. I don't know what, what triggered it, but I remember just being up at night and saying to myself, like, are you really going to quit now? Like, you're right at the end. This is like four and a half years later of like hard work, sacrifice. How much have you sacrificed? Like there's so many like sat Sunday family photos throughout the four years where I'm not there because I was sat in Costa like writing an essay or something. And I just, I don't know what it was in me, but I was like, you know what, I'm going to do this. And it was unreal. And my supervisors didn't think I would be able to because three months to write a dissertation is is very tight especially for masters yeah masters ten thousand words and then four weeks later i changed my title so i had eight weeks now wow. and it was it was a steep hurdle i mean when i submitted the sense of relief that i felt the sense of achieving you know i didn't need anybody to pat me on the back i was patting myself on the back because i genuinely did not think that i was going to reach this milestone and um, a few weeks ago, my supervisor called me to tell me I'd actually passed with a merit. So wow. amazing. Congratulations. Um, yeah, like I said, I don't know what it was that triggered me that night, but something just said, look, find everything that you have in you now and just keep going those last three months because it's a shame to let go of this journey. And even though it wouldn't have been a failure, right? I think whenever you're kind of seeking postgraduate learning or qualification you're doing it for yourself you're not doing it for everyone else if you feel like something's not serving you anymore why waste the hours in it but i think for me i've never been one to quit or give up and i know that in life i wouldn't have been able to carry that well whilst i had full reason and full justification in my mind i know that would have weighed down on me so i'm so glad that i found that last bit of resilience and resistance and just push 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 through and, and submitted mm -hmm. so yeah did the fact that the supervisors i mean they were advising you to exit was that because of everything that you had going on yeah so it happened in my third year because i wanted to go on mat leave and i was deferring some of my coursework from my second year because we had really big financial hit in the second year which meant that I was focusing heavily on targets at the practice and not on submitting the work and and I submitted that information and they accepted it they just felt that I wouldn't be able to achieve two years worth of clinical work in one year and they said why don't you exit with a certificate and then come back when you're ready I knew I wouldn't come back when I was ready and I felt you know, like I said, I'm one of those people, if you tell me you can't do something, I'm going to prove you wrong. And So it didn't discourage you, it motivated you? Yeah, it motivated me. It was, um, it was actually, the, you know, the director of the, the dental school who got on the phone to me to say, you wow. know, why don't you think about exiting? And I said to him, I'm OK, I'm going to carry on. The reason why I asked that is because <coughs> in business in general, I think there's a lot of people that struggle <laughs> with advice. Um, I mean, you never really get the advice that you necessarily want to hear there's a lot of you a lot of self-belief required in business yeah. and also in education to be fair because um a lot of the time in schools when you're growing up people teachers they will they will have their opinion on you they don't obviously have the foresight to know where you're going to end up mm. but they will have their opinion i mean i i can from my own experience um you know teachers used to say oh you, you're very distracted and you talk too much and this kind of stuff but then if you look at it into real life talking too much has led me to this podcast yeah, so yeah, exactly. it's, it's, it's crazy <laughs> but you have to really dig deep and believe in yourself so yeah. for anyone that has struggled with opinions whether that is from their family whether that is from superiors in education um other than you know just digging deep what, what would you advise in trying to silence the noise I think, first of all, your your own vision and your own purpose has to be clear. You've got to know what you want. <clears throat> and the other thing is your own validation of why you're doing this thing. 
when you are internally well validated then the opinion of people around you will like you said just be noise and this is something that i'm finding more that i have to work on myself and i think you know i even caught myself the other day telling my son because he, he says something and i said to Musa, it doesn't matter what they think what do you think are you doing the right thing i do you have the right intentions so i think opinions of people we you know if they are your loved ones and they are your close friends and you know they're coming from a good place then listen right but then you have to have an honest conversation with your own self to say is this something is this something that's genuine or is it is this something that i can overcome so let's let's take a little bit of a of a turn um you know we've spoken about your journey we've spoken about how you ended up here um but eight years later you've built a successful business you've persevered through the dark times you've believed in yourself and you've and you've conquered so what were some of the things that really allowed your business to flourish and for anyone that's maybe trying to get into business what are some of the practical <coughs> things that you could advise um the first thing is make sure you're very clear on your vision um you have to be really really you have to almost imagine it you almost can like feel it in your mind like what what it will look like what it will feel like walking into this business what will your team be like what will people how will people refer to it that's always got to be there and then the second thing i would say is be prepared for a long journey yeah i think a lot of people give up in business because they have this dream and then you know six months a year later a year later they're still not making a profit they still you know and they think oh, maybe this isn't for me you really have to give it. I mean, when, when we first acquired this business, we were kind of comfortable to say we we'll probably won't turn over a profit for five years. That's kind of how you should plan. And um, keep pushing yourself. Keep critiquing yourself. Don't, you know, you, you said you've got a successful business. I still don't view it as a successful business because my vision is a lot bigger. And I am paving the way for things to be bigger. And we've got some exciting announcements coming up in the next few months. But don't ever feel too comfortable where you are because the minute you start to feel comfortable where you are you won't grow suddenly everything will look normal so always try to look at your business with fresh eyes how can i improve especially a business where you are dealing with people at the beginning i used to get very you know if we got a bad review or a comment i get really defensive because this is like my baby right and i know we're it's like they're insulting hard. you directly yeah whereas now my attitude is completely different you know if we get any hint of criticism my practice manager my clinic coordinator is on the phone talking to that patient how can we make it better because i realize that it's not about me it's not about how i feel about the business if i'm not able to deliver to my patients and if they're not able to see the effort then i'm not going to grow yeah so i think that's that's the other thing is you have to be really open to criticism open to critique and don't ever be comfortable. Always think about how can I get better? How can I improve? How can I make things better? And I have that attitude to my clinical work. So I'm my biggest critique, you know, every post I've ever posted, I'm not really 100% happy with it. And I think, right, how can I make it better next time? And I have the same attitude with the business and with the staff and, you know, really, you, you've got to have the right vision and the right attitude because that will trickle down to your team and you can't be there all the time so if your attitude to complaints is very defensive and your team are going to have that attitude and rather than saying no guys like let's own up let's see how we can make it better mm -hmm. um and that's the other thing that i would say is if you are planning to grow and this is something i learned from my husband is that you need to rely on a team you can't you can't, you know, you're not, what does he say to me always? You're not scalable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. That's Jabber's not scalable. <laughs> He's like, you need more Dr. Jabber's. You need to clone yourself. And I'm like, well, how am I going to do that? But in essence, that, you know, that's my, that's my vision now for the next few years is that I can't work here seven days a week, 24 seven. And then even if I did, my reach is still limited because only one of me. So now it's about growing our brand and growing our ethos and, getting the team on board and that's so important that your team are on board and they're part of your vision because they play a really really big part in your success you know because they're the ones that are carrying that ship with you and so invest in the right people and the right training 
And you know, there's nothing more valuable than an employee who starts to love the business and starts to treat it like its own, because that's when you can go on holiday and just relax because you're comfortable knowing that your team are going to look after this ship and make sure it carries on sailing. It's 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 funny that you say that because um, I, whenever I recruit for for my own business, it's never about skill set. I mean, they have to have a a skill set, but it's character, attitude, and attitude that I look for because if they have the right character, they have the right attitude, the rest will follow. I'm exactly like you, Hamza. I always say you can train anybody to do anything, right? But you can't change their attitude and their mindset. So if you have people with the right attitude or the right work ethos, then I don't care where where they are in their skill sets. We can work on that. We can grow that. But if the attitude is not there, you'll never get it. 100%. You mentioned that you you still don't feel that you've built a success. And yeah. obviously you're being very modest when you're saying that. But what does success mean to you? That's a really good question. Um, I'm, I feel I'm getting closer to where I want to be. But um, my vision really is to kind of create a recognized brand for excellence in dentistry and aesthetics and for that brand to be recognized all over the London. So there'll be many more peace dental centers. Amazing, amazing. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that's kind of my my vision really. So it won't be just one shop. (laughs) Because a lot of, I think success as a metric is subjective but also i think it's getting confusing nowadays with social media and things that we see online and whether it's successful in terms of followers whether it's old school revenue whether yeah. it's perception and I, I heard something the other day i can't remember who 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 i heard it from but the quote was being successful in business is not about necessarily money it's about how long you're willing to go yeah and just not giving up it means you're a successful entrepreneur because the dark days, the things that your staff maybe don't even see, the hardships, the ability to know that you have to make payroll every month and all these little stresses that you do have as a business, especially um, considering the past 12 months that we've had in in the whole oh, world. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that was tough. So for anyone that's maybe struggling with understanding what is success to them and you know they're just looking up other people and are trying to you know figure out what contentment is for them how would you advise for them to really just find themselves because mm. that in entrepreneurship is is probably the yeah. most important thing right yeah. it's understanding yourself 100 percent. i think I, i'm glad you mentioned social media because i think it's kind of created a new definition of success i think historically maybe success was just monetary whereas i i don't really agree with that either because there will there will come a limit to how much money how much happiness and contentment money can bring you there's a ceiling you know you bought the car you've got the house you know what more just a better car and a better house exactly so your your passion for why you're doing something has to be more than just that bottom line that won't drive you through that will actually make you a tighter business person you don't want to invest you don't want to you know because you're trying to hoard it so i would i would say don't use that as your marker um i remember when i was training um my trainer actually said to me and it always stuck with me he said don't ever chase the money do a good job and then the money will find you and i think that goes for any business set out your business make customer service your priority produce a good product or a service and people will then find you and seek you and they'll speak for yourself and the reward in a satisfied patient is worth so much more than the bottom line at the end of the day so um, social media has blurred that lines because now one of the metrics for success could potentially be followers and likes and engagement, which any serious person in business would tell you that's not really a measure of anything. So I would say be, be cautious that you don't get sucked into that vacuum where you start comparing yourself to other people and make sure that your metrics for success are not ones that heavily focus on social media. Social media is a very powerful tool. It's an inspiring tool. I've learned lots from social media just by following esteemed colleagues and how they do their work and... um, Being able to connect with your audience. Yeah, I mean, there was a point in time where 90% of our patients were coming from Instagram. So that's powerful. I'm never going to turn my back on it and I'm always going to be there. But 
there might have been a time when I got drawn into it for the wrong reasons and started to, to focus too much on the numbers, which don't actually mean anything. Um, so I think keep it in mind if you're a new business owner, use it as a tool of inspiration. Use it as an opportunity to network and connect with people in your field. But just be mindful not to get sucked into the numbers. Someone could have 100,000 followers and, you know, they don't actually get much, much business. But you could have 1,000 followers and they're all your patients or they're all your clients or they're all purchasing your products. And that in itself for your business and for your growth is going to be a lot more powerful than just having these big figures and numbers. And social media comes with its challenges you know I some of my associates my mentees you know when we talk about opening social media accounts I say to them look be very clear with what you want out of it are you trying to be a blogger are you trying to be an influencer are you trying to be someone who becomes famous through it or are you trying to use it as a tool to market the quality of work that you can produce they're two very different business models for social media and it's, it's good to make that clear right at the start when you've just opened your account. Why am I doing this? What am I using this channel for? If you're really clear, even if you find yourself getting sucked into it, you take a step back and you say, hold on, what am I actually doing this for? And I think that's really important. And if you find yourself getting sucked into this comparison game, just turn it off and focus back onto your business and saying, right, let me do, let me knuckle down and get some more work done. Mm -hmm. that's from a business perspective and, and great advice by the way um, but I want to be mindful that I'm sure we've got quite a few females uh, watching this that have you know are interested to see what you, what you have to say um, and being a, a dentist and, and dealing with clients your business also is benefiting from social media because you know people do want to look good and they do want to do treatments and they do want to sort out their teeth so I'm sure you also get consumers maybe they're not anywhere near business but they come to you to improve how they look of course all most of them most so of so obviously balancing you know the business side of it and the personal side of it do you ever kind of think about how because i'm guessing you you must see personal stories of of why people are doing this why they want to get their teeth sorted and beyond from the hygiene perspective what would you advise to people that are just too kind of focused on the vanity side of, of social media and how to kind of step out of that whilst also balancing that you do want to look good but a lot of the things on social media aren't real if that makes sense yeah yeah i i think there's there's been of obviously a real danger it's it's been documented that the the use of social media has probably increased people's um anxiety anxiety and and like insight into themselves but i think we need to pause and also recognize that the pursuit for beauty is not something that's new. This is with inherent within mankind since the day we were created. We have always sought to improve our appearance, look better, youthfulness. You know, the Egyptians were known with all these oils that they used to do. So this is not a new thing. The other thing we need to recognize is that, psycho you know, it has been proven that psychologically people who do look better do have a slight privilege in life. And actually, you know, there's a very famous study of children, a child as young as three months will respond to a better looking face. And when we say better looking, we're not talking about necessarily the typical definitions of what beauty is. We're talking about a, pay, a face that is proportionately balanced. And there are mathematical formulas that can be applied to certain people's features. And usually faces that we perceive to be attractive proportionally fit well into this mathematical equation and all the ratios are well balanced so one of the faces that proportionally fits all these equations is Angelina Jolie so that's why she's considered to be a very beautiful woman so these things are inherent Hamza they're not necessarily um, they're not necessarily um, a creation of the society that we're in they are inherent within us it's just kind of increased however now the danger is is that with the swipe of a finger within a second you could look so much more different and that's not right um the photoshopping the the images of beauty that are being portrayed that are not even achievable that's the danger and before you could only access that in magazines when you look through the magazines all these models have been photoshopped now we all have access to it 
And what it's slowly doing is it's distorting our ideals of what beauty standards are. And if you're the kind of person who's always using a filter, you will slowly start to not being able to accept your own face without that filter. And subconsciously, that's really dangerous. So I am all for cosmetic treatments and I'm all for people enhancing their appearance safely, providing that the reasons behind it are, are, you know, are right reasons. And I'm not one to judge anybody and call them vain because I think if you're somebody who's never lived with an insecurity, you'll never know what that feels like for someone. And it could be really easy for you, you know. Um, I get a lot of patients that say, you know, everyone tells me my nose is fine. Yeah? But it's not about what everyone feels. It's about what you're carrying inside you. And um, often it can hold you back in so many ways, subconsciously. And the biggest thing that I'm so passionate about is smiling. And this is something that I find really interesting because as a society, we don't have a problem with people, like, perfecting their smiles. We think it's okay, right? You, you know... As a society, we've accepted that straight mm-hmm. teeth are the best thing. And yeah, you're, you're happy- encouraged to get braces when you're right? early. We are happy to allow non-consenting children to go through a very invasive two-year permanent process, which is painful, to get straighter teeth. Now, none of those children were malnourished because they couldn't eat because their teeth were crooked. But we have accepted as a society that children, that humans will thrive better if their physical, if their teeth are straighter, right? And we nobody questions that. It's true. But when it's an adult point. decides, consenting adult decides to get a few injections to straighten their nose, we're all like, oh, vain. And there are these kids running around with braces. This is why I okay. wanted you on. This yeah. is the perspective I wanted yeah. to hear. <laughs> right? So I think, let's, I, I remember once I, I got a DM and I get these a lot. Sister, I love your work, but isn't it haram? And if you look at my Instagram page, I have all my facial aesthetics down one side and all my dental down on one side. And I said to him, which part, the face or the teeth? And he went, whoa. They don't even think the teeth is an issue anymore. He's like, suddenly he'd realized, you know, when people say, isn't Hannah, I'm saying, but I've been doing cosmetic for 10 years. I've been changing the way people look permanently. We've been doing it on our kids. Why is it an issue now? So, so I, that's how I feel about it. But I do appreciate that. And something that we always do in practice, we do you know, a very discreet mental health screening. Because if somebody's pursuit for treatment is because of mental health issues, then they need to be signposted in the right direction because this treatment's not going to give them what they're looking for. They actually need medical help in order to be able to free themselves from these anxieties and these issues that they have. So that's really important. But I think it's about a balance. And I think we need to stop the judgment and allow open conversations about it and accept that it's, you know, it's no different to getting your hair cut. Yeah, it's it's a spectrum. Beauty is a spectrum. And we will all lie at different points in that spectrum from the plastic surgery, permanent, complete change, to plucking your eyebrows and trimming your beard i mean are you really pulling hair out of your face like (laughs) why would you do that but you do it are you really putting chemicals on your hair to change the color and cover your grays why but nobody says that so it's it's in that spectrum and i think we need to appreciate that it is within that spectrum and that's how i kind of you know i've always wanted to kind of do a little post about it because i get it so often isn't it haram isn't it haram um especially that a lot of the work that we do is non-permanent reversible so i i, I kind of get the permanency argument um but with facial aesthetics it's it's completely that's different scope. Yeah. that's really really valuable one thing i do want to touch up on whilst you know not trying to make it too controversial is based on the whole mental health and vanity kind of argument um it's unfortunate that a lot of people have decided to take the easy way out of um, maybe going abroad um, trying to get the best deal and they only really realize when it goes wrong or when they see a horror story Um, and I'm sure you must get that question quite a lot from from clients and patients so what's your thoughts on that 
Um, so my first thing that I would say is there are fantastic dentists all over the world and we don't just all live in London. <laughs> so there are amazing dentists everywhere. So do your research. The second thing I would say is that don't just always focus on the financial cost. There is a biological cost and that biological cost you can't replace. So when your teeth are cut down into pegs, you can't get that back. So yes, you've saved yourself one, two, three thousand pounds. But biologically, you have spent a lot. And that's something that people, I think, they're not very well educated in. Um, nothing we do in dentistry is permanent. Um, you know, I always tell my patients, if the teeth that God gave us have now failed, I'm not going to give you anything better. I can only try to do the best whilst preserving as much as I can. And unfortunately, there are some practices in dentistry that don't value that philosophy of what's going to happen when this fails you should always plan for failure are you going to be significantly worse off or are you going to be not that far off from where you started and now in the right with the right tools you can achieve amazing cosmetic results with very little biological investment which means that when it fails you're kind of back to where you started Whereas you could save a lot of money and go for drastic, but when that fails, you are in trouble. You are in trouble biologically because now you've lost teeth and you're gonna go through a lot of pain. Financially, boy, you better sell your house, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because dentistry is, dentistry is expensive. But there's another really nice quote that says, dentistry is not expensive, neglect is expensive. Yeah, we can talk about that later as well. So I think, for any youngsters out there, and I get people, you know, I was planning to go to so-and-so, and we know the country that pops up, but I don't like to just focus on one area. There's really lucrative packages, you know, they're packaged with resorts and holidays, and it's fun, and you know, you get your teeth in a day. So I would just say, just, just be mindful of what state your teeth are gonna be in, if that fails. And not if that fails, when that fails. And that when might be, if you're lucky, five to 10 years, if you're unlucky, much, much sooner. Have you ever had any patients that have had a bad job and asked you to fix it? Yes, I, I try to, it's a difficult one. I try to be very open and honest from the beginning about the fact that I'm really limited to what I can do now, given that I am, you know, working in a compromised situation. Um, but I don't turn them away fully because I think, you know, we, we have a duty of care to people. And just because people make a mistake, it doesn't mean we completely write them off and say, no, sorry, we can't help you. But I'm very, very clear in the beginning about just how much I can, if I can at all. Mm -hmm. What well, I mean, to prevent all of that, I mean, all the headache, um, whether that is from childhood or adulthood, what are some of the practical hygiene tips that you give for teeth? I, I can't tell you. Then, then really? we'll be out of a job. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So <laughs> dentistry is preventable. Okay, so your, your followers need to listen to that. If everybody did what they're supposed to do, 90% of dentists would be out of a job. Unless you're a cosmetic dentist like me, then you'll still be in a job, okay? But no, dentistry really is preventable. And I try to educate all my patients on this. And that is majority of dental disease can be completely prevented. And I do see sometimes adults in their 60s and 70s, they've never had a single filling, yeah? So it's not part of aging. It's not like, oh, you age like your age, your skin wrinkles and things like that. Teeth can remain healthy. Minor changes, of course, like wear and tear, but nothing significant. So um, obviously the obvious thing, the, the brushing twice a day, you know, so many people miss miss one of the brushes and i think that just comes down to not really appreciating what is going on in their mouth and actually when they realize they're like oh okay maybe i should just make the time to brush flossing at least as a minimum three times a week i know you're supposed to every day but i always tell my patients start with three times a week because believe me when you start you will notice the difference in your mouth and how cleaner your mouth feels and smells you will want to do it every day um using a fluoride toothpaste. There's a lot of arguments about fluoride and whatever, but fluoride is the one mineral that strengthens teeth and prevents cavities for forming within the mouth. So that's really important. So that's from the oral hygiene. Visit a dentist regularly, you know, don't wait until you have a problem because then it's too late. Go when you're fine, when you're not in pain, because we can then 
pre-assess, we can take x-rays and we might be able to see things very early on, alert you, notify you and tell you about it. And similarly with children, please don't take them when they're five, six with a cavity. I mean, how am I supposed to manage this environment now? Your child's in pain, I need to numb them up. If you'd bought them four years ago when they were one, you and I could have had a chat about your diet and what you're feeding at home, what's going on. I could have had a look, I could have familiarized them with the environment. We could have played games, gone on the spaceship and given them a sticker and made it fun experience. And more importantly, picked up the early signs that would lead us to that point five years later when now teeth are having to be removed. So don't delay going to the That's dentist. That's very true, actually, because a lot of a lot of kids are actually traumatized from young because yeah. they the, the the first dental experience that they remember is when it was a painful one. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's a, a combination like uh, you know people older than me probably did have quite a traumatic experience you know dentists were not as maybe understanding of patients anesthetics wasn't good it was a case of just hold that child down we need to get this tooth out dentistry's transformed now i mean a lot of my patients fall asleep whilst i'm treating them that's how comfortable they are it's painless you're completely comfortable i actually have to gently kind of go can you please open because <laughs> they're like closing in and i can't do my work but um, with children, yes, parents are taking them when they're like five, six, with cavities, in pain already from their teeth. I mean, if anyone's ever had toothache, you know, I haven't had toothache, but it's really, really uncomfortable. So imagine like a child going through that. It's really distressing. Then to come to this really strange environment, which now looks even scarier with all our PPE, then mm -hmm. having to cooperate to treatment. I mean, as adults, we're like reluctant to have a, a vaccine or something. So my my advice, if I can get anything across tonight, would be to parents, please, you know, in the in the UK, dentistry is free for children and you can register your child with a dentist as soon as their first tooth comes out. Please register them and take them every six months. Don't see that the it was like a waste of time because the dentist didn't do anything. The doing could just be in you having that conversation with the dentist, educating yourself in your child, getting familiar with the environment and realizing it's a fun place to come to and being inspired by it and leaving with a toothbrush rather than going when things are really like bad and it's like an emergency situation. Wow. So much value in this episode. I, I think uh, a lot of young people are going to be inspired to follow your career path. So if there are people that are now thinking, you know what, maybe I should go into dentistry. What would you advise in terms of preparation of the mindset yeah. of, of, of actually doing it? Yeah. First of all, I 100% advocate it. I absolutely love it as a career. It's incredibly rewarding. It combines science, art, people skills, changing lives all in one, and it's flexible. So if you've not heard, if you've thought, oh, not sure about it, definitely look into it. But also get yourself mentally ready that probably from the age of 15, 16, you're going to have to be a little bit more serious about life than maybe your friends and your colleagues. And you're going to have to make sacrifices from that age, from your GCSEs. Um, but it's fun. You know, it's not all doom and gloom because hopefully you'll be around people who are also in the same boat as you, aspiring to, to get somewhere in life. And you will be with people who are doing that. Um, so definitely go for it. One thing, this is this is more for me. Yeah. Um, that I'm quite intrigued to actually know from you because being in the household that you're in, um, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on raising children because obviously I haven't got there yet, as you can tell from my inexperienced question but when you do achieve a level of success I mean in your case it's it's both parents achieving individual success even how do you then trickle that down into the kids because it's, it's a balance of not wanting to make them too spoiled and also not wanting them to not have the things that you didn't have perhaps um, so what, what's your advice on that? I mean, it's completely off topic. Yeah, no, I really, just, like, I really like this question because I've always been really mindful that I don't want to spoil my children. And I'll often say no to things, even though they are really like simple things. But I'm so mindful that they are growing up in a very privileged environment and um, that I don't want them to lose sight of life and of the fact that you know people have to work hard and I, I don't want them to to kind of 
be spoiled kids basically so I'm really mindful of that in my upbringing in reminding them in you know giving charity you know we never we can never walk past a homeless person without giving them something and that's something that they've trained to do now so you know my son will look at me like mum and I'm like I, I don't think I have anything on me now so just putting things into perspective reminding them themselves reminding them constantly you know that they are in a privileged environment and not saying yes to everything you know we have we don't purchase things every time we go out that's really important saying no um setting rules um and you know as uh, the other thing is they see you so i think when you lead by example you know my daughter now she's turning three one of her questions is, mommy why do you go to work why does daddy have to go to work and obviously the answers i give her now are very simple but as she grows she will be able to see the kind of journey that her mother led and i hope that inspires her to say you know i can also make a difference and and i can do this in life it's amazing honestly this has been an episode full of value i'm really excited Thank because you. i think people are going to really enjoy this um but before we before we wrap up we're going to have a little bit of fun now okay this is called the rapid fire question so oh completely gosh. Oh gosh. Okay. relax I'm now ready. Uh, <laughs> okay. this is nothing to do with business or anything <laughs> like right, that it's fine. just a bit of fun for people to get to know you a bit more on a personal level um so just answer the questions as quick as you can fine cool okay let's go night in or night out now night in <laughs> i don't know if you're gonna answer this one but pepsi or coke <laughs> diet either one <laughs> <laughs> money or love love Laundry or dishes? I don't do either. <laughs> dishes, dishes. <laughs> Coffee or tea? The coffee. Your favourite city in the world? Oh, this is so cliche, but Dubai at the moment. <laughs> nice car or nice home? Nice. Car or nice home? Home. Um, Netflix or YouTube? Netflix. Horror or comedy movie? Comedy, all the way. <laughs> when you're not working, how do you like to spend your time? you really want me to answer this kids family when the kids are done i work <laughs> i do more really? work yeah yeah okay and that's because you're just like I, i'll read i'll listen to podcasts i watch webinars read up business books just that's that's what i really enjoy so addiction working yeah maybe <laughs> <laughs> all-time favorite meal meal oh um oh i don't know or cuisine maybe all-time all favorite cuisine probably arab cuisine it's boring good right <laughs> <laughs> what was your first job my first job was a dental nurse where would you like to retire i'm really content here in london yeah i'm, I'm really happy right now where i am okay passenger or driver driver role model growing up um probably my parents that's a good answer and finally, if you had one superpower, what would it be and why? Read people's minds. Why? Um, it would just make communication so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You, yeah. you already know what they're thinking. Exactly. You don't need to ask them. Yeah, exactly. I think that would help with especially um, the whole female-male kind of thing, communication-wise. Yeah, it's true. A lot of the time, you don't really get, get to be on the same page sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Communication, so. I'm guessing, is, is very important to you. Communication is really important to me and I'm one of those people that will write things down, you know, it's not uncommon for my husband to receive a long text message from me about how I'm feeling about something um, because I just think, and I've done it as, as we've grown in our relationship, I do it a lot more because there's just no point dwelling on things that you feel so passionately about or feel so strongly about and most of the time you'll realise that the other person didn't even wasn't even aware that you felt that way so there's never like an intentional thing and I think people make that mistake a lot they just don't talk to one another honestly to say like look I, you know I didn't like that or you know um, mm -hmm. I, I read a really nice meme recently like a nice quote that couples have recently introduced where they say well I need some attention right now and it solves like so much arguments just being open and honest um, I think is something that would just transform so many <laughs> lives, but it's always a work in progress. Mm -hmm. What's some of the personal things that you've learned in lockdown? Um, I really have liked lockdown. We were typical, you know, eating out a lot. Um, you know, our fun was like always doing something like going to the museum, going, you know, 
and suddenly we had to kind of look more inwards and going on walks um I cooked more in lockdown than I ever cooked my entire marriage so that was really nice <laughs> you know I think lockdown just gave us an opportunity to look closer within to find that kind of source of happiness and fun and and I think that is just I'm so grateful for that because now we can just enjoy a walk around the block as a family rather than having to do something whereas before it was always like you know what are we going to do whereas now it's let's just go to the park and let's spend time together amazing amazing I'm sure now people have fallen in love with you especially if they've never spoken to you or heard That's from you before very kind of you thank so you so what's the best place for anyone to follow you if they want to follow your journey so they're more than welcome to uh, follow me on Instagram okay uh, we'll put it in the description as well so thank you. be sure to support um, honestly one of my favourite episodes 